Sounds good. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Troxell, and you've joined us for another Art Week TV arts interview. And today, I've got Jacob Cooperman, street artist, activist, and former garde de manger in a Michelin star rated restaurant. No. Welcome. <laughs> hey, Dan, how are you? Good. Happy to be here. Thanks for Good. doing this. It's been really cool of you to, to interview everybody. Yeah, this is great. You know, we met in uh, March last year, I think at the uh, Riverview Artist Salon, and uh, we had a nice conversation there. So mm -hmm. it's great to catch up to you again. So I got one question. Let's start with the Michelin rated restaurant in Chicago. So how did you end up there? And more importantly, how did you get out of there? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think I, I went down a path of cooking professionally. Um, the first place I cooked at was here in Des Moines when I was 18. Uh, I cooked at um, what has now evolved into Django. It used to be a different restaurant, um, but uh, anyway, so I kind of went down this path of culinary arts and cooked in Chicago at a restaurant that was extremely high end. Um, and it was a blast, but, um, uh, you know, as I kind of did start to, I mean, ultimately the, the restaurant owner sold this restaurant. And so <clears throat> that was an exit point for me. And at that point I just kind of, um, was ready to switch things up a little bit and have a little uh, more predictable uh, tasks at work. And so I found a sales job in Chicago um, and enjoyed that for a few and a, you know, two and a half years or so. And then uh, I've been back here in Des Moines for three years. So. Um, and you were making t-shirts for a while. While you were in there? Des Moines, uh, no, I that was about a year ago. <laughs> okay. In Des Moines, I, I worked at a t-shirt shop for a minute, um, just to kind of understand Illustrator a little better, and uh, you know, explore that the side of the design world. So I think ultimately, what I what I'm getting at is that I've just been exploring how to be an artist, and I think it uh, really took root in the kitchen, um, but. Uh, the lifestyle of cooking was too too intense i think uh you know like leaving work at 2 a.m or 4 a.m and stuff so right and you have a you have a strong arts background as well as far as training and classes in high school and college and you I always, say, you always I had something I always artistic just, <clears throat> i always had like a class um when i could have an elective i would take like drawing or uh, painting or something so but for the most part I just kind of taught myself so then you had a pivotal point of no return so to speak when you met uh, Kansas City artist Chris Dahlquist last year at the Des Moines Arts Festival yeah she was how in did town that affect and, you and your art uh, speaking with her was one of the first um, kind of art advocates and art um, I guess art advocates, but um, she was, you know, what she said to me that was interesting is she pointed out the difference in language uh, and going about creating public art and uh, <clears throat> just simply the words public art uh, can have so many meanings. So it's important to define them. For example, uh, if you say public art to somebody, they might think like tax dollars might be their first thought or if you say public art to somebody else, they, their first thought might be a mural that they took a photo of last weekend. So um, <clears throat> it's, it's just a really interesting open field. And uh, she made just a very impactful point on me just to, just to kind of point out um, how public art could have so many different meanings and impacts on people. So public art, that's not just about, um, it's not just about a definition. It's also context, right? I mean, how do you, how do you create public art? Is it, is it signage, memes? Tell me about <clears throat> that. Uh, for me, the public art that I'm kind of producing is just uh, murals. Um, um, do you prefer 
public art to street art? Because I know we've talked about that too. I like public art, yeah. So I, I think it is important to define it. Um, you know, does, I, I think, go ahead. Does it create a context of ownership? Um, maybe no, maybe more uh, a sense of community. Um, okay. A platform for people to use as um, in a locator, right? So meet me by this hot dog mural and everyone knows what the hot dog mural is or something, you know? So um, I think it can be a, a source of community. I think it can be a landmark. I think it can be educational. Um, so public art, it, it can also be sculpture. <clears throat> it could be, um, you know, in the shape of a prairie as well. So. Uh, well, I, I would like to have you have a conversation with Mary Jones sometime. Um, she, I don't know if you saw it, but um, I did an interview with her and she is an Iowa Arts Council fellow from last year uh, through their fellowship I, I, program. I didn't see that one. What did, what did you two talk about? Well, here's, here's what it is. Um, you know, she is, uh, I don't know how to, let's see, what was the term that she used to describe it? Um, no, the term, I lost the term, but in any case, she does these very extensive walks and now she's beginning to do synchronized walks with people around the world. Um, mm -hmm. And her, her comments, I mean, obviously you're seeing the world at a much slower pace and you're absorbing it more than once. And her, her most interesting comment is that, you know, you see, you see the things what people put out there that they want you to see. Um, but also you begin to see the things that people don't want you to see. And what goes out there is what, uh, you know, occludes what the real picture is perhaps. Mm -hmm. But um, the, the, the whole idea of uh, integration into the piece of art, you know, like public art, you know, I see a, I see a synergy there. I see a yeah, great conversation. And in, in talking about the things that you don't want to see when you're in the process of it, it's like, it's really hard to leave a mural on day one of like day seven or of a seven day, you know, works. But, uh, you know, what's hard about leaving a mural is that you're, you're kind of exposing it and like leaving it unfinished. And I always think that that part's interesting. Um, and I really like that interaction I, I imagine people have of, of like seeing it on the end of the first day and just like kind of being disgusted by it or like, you know, like thinking that it's a finished product when it's not. And I think, I think that makes me laugh, but it's really neat that they get a walk by for the next like few days and kind of see it progress. And um, so for Art Week, I'm really excited because there's a couple murals um, that I'm working on <clears throat> that are like pretty high traffic. I think it'll be nice to um, have people view it from a from an outdoor, like safe, social distance. But um, can you say where those are? Yeah, so two of them are on 42nd Street, right near Roosevelt Shopping Center. Um, one of them is 1433 Walnut, which is <clears throat> where Teehees is in the cave, um, kind of near Horizon Line Coffee in exile. Um, and then the last one is at the YMCA Supportive Housing. That's on like Southwest Ninth and MLK. Great. Yeah. So, so, um, so you were talking about the idea of your art being finished or unfinished and you know a passerby wouldn't really know that what you know whether it's in the unfinished piece and you might also have somebody else who wants to interact with the art and think they're going to finish it for you you know either as a you know to deface it or um, to embellish it so and the what uh, the point that i'm getting at is you know when we had this discussion uh, a couple of days ago you had done a, a mural um, or, you know, a piece of street art 
Um, and ironically, on the uh, the anniversary of the the opening of Auschwitz, or actually the discovery of Auschwitz and closing it, um, somebody had done something to your artwork. Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, it was just, um, I had just finished a mural in January <clears throat> and uh, somebody seemingly like happened to walk past it and just kind of put like a swastika on the face and uh, I don't know, it just kind of tarnished it a little bit, but it happened to also be uh, a day that was the anniversary of the, um, just playing with my liberation, dog. the liberation. Yeah. Auschwitz. It was yeah. this, it was the anniversary of the liberation, and so um, I don't know. I I had made a post in regard to the liberation, and then on that same day, kind of went back to this mural and and saw the swastika. And I think there was no correlation. I think that it was a random kind of like graffiti bomb, but uh, yeah, it just ironic it was, it nonetheless. Was, yeah, it was ironic. It it also <clears throat> raised a couple interesting points because, you know, that person and I both wrote on that wall or, or put paint on that wall, but like I usually try to create something light and joyful and it's like they came at it from such a darker uh, side. And, uh, but I thought it was so interesting that we both like, you know, used that wall, like the same wall and for very different purposes, I think. So your artwork speaks to the people that are walking by. I mean, it's not just, mm -hmm. it's not just images um, or embellishments. It's, you also, do you have words involved in your street art? <clears throat> I tried. Or, yeah. I mean, I try to like make a statement, but I, I do actively stay away from using words. I think, I think it's interesting <clears throat> um, to play with just images. I think, I think working with words is fun and interesting. I just prefer images, I think. So. Um. <laughs> and art is like language, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's an expression. You know, we, ex we take the external world and internalize it and then speak, you know, or interpret. I think it's a visual language. I think I speak visually much, much better than some other forms of communication that we use. So that's interesting. <laughs> so you're more comfortable with that. Yeah, I, I can draw for <clears throat> 12 hours, but you know, I start reading and I like fall asleep halfway down <laughs> the page. And it's just like, you know, I can read visually, whether it be like the lines or the colors or shapes or something. But yeah, I think there's a language in and of itself of, of like visual arts. Does all of your, do all of your street art, um, public art have uh, intention? Do they make an, are they always making a statement? I think so. And I usually try to stay in like the joyful side of things. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, something I painted recently was like a robot watering uh, some, some wildflowers. And there was like an urban, <coughs> excuse me, there was like an urban landscape into this robot and then flowers and it was just this kind of machine versus nature. Um, and there was some narrative for me behind it about uh, just like what COVID is and kind of that juncture between nature and machine. So uh, that's something I paid in, in Des Moines on uh, 34th and St. John's Road. So. Uh, when did you do that? It wasn't, that was, it's not that was like, our week, is it? That was like March, uh, the second or third week in March, I did that. Oh, okay. So, yeah. 
I'm going to throw something out there. What do you think about perfection? Do you mm. believe in it? No, I think perfection is terrible. <laughs> I think, uh, I think it's toxic. I think it's toxic. I think, um, I think it's helpful. I think it is a moving target. I think it's, uh, detrimental when it, uh, prevents you from creating or it prevents you from saying something's finished or, um, you know, if it, so is that always a, um, antithesis to your aesthetic? It, I think it's become part of my aesthetic because the avoidance there's some, of perfection. Yeah. I don't know that it's the avoidance of it so much as like the acknowledgement of it in the sense of like Japanese artwork, for example, like a Japanese potter. Um, there's a type of pottery that the kiln and the ash from the kiln creates the the texture and the pattern of the pottery. <clears throat> and so just that idea of like, you've put 50% of the work in by creating this clay, and then you leave the other 50% up to the fire and the ash to like mm. color it. And yeah, so I think that is something I saw in Maine uh, in like 2015, maybe 2015. And, uh, that's been really impactful as well. Just the idea of like, you know, you bring something halfway, whether it be like, I'll bring my hand and pen to the paper, but like, I'll try to close my mind off to let it create. And uh, hopefully it's that element of like, I bring half of it to the table and, you know, um, the other half is creativity. So. On the other hand, how, does that do permanence or does perfection and permanence, do they relate to each other? I think they do. And um, yeah, it's really nice that you bring that up because the permanent uh, component of a mural at one point I may have thought like, Oh, if it's not going to be permanent, why would I put it up? But um, I think it's important to acknowledge kind of this, all things change component and, and how rare permanency is. Um, I, th I think something, you know, very few things are permanent. So I think that has been very influential for me. So what's your timeline then with something that you put up? What do you, what, what is a good time for it to be around? Um, I don't know. I think paintings and restaurants and music albums have kind of lifespans. Um, so maybe an image really fits really well and it sticks around. Um, maybe after a year. Well, that was an interesting response on the line. You might need to re repeat that. We're having some line trouble. We might have ended this interview. I'm not sure you. <laughs> it's funny because I'm looking at the fan in your back room and it's moving very, very slowly. So the line speed is very slow. And that was the end of the interview. Uh, didn't really intend on it, but we had some technical difficulties. It looks like Jacob might be coming in. Jacob. Hey. You there, you there again? You've moved sideways too. That's interesting. Well, this is almost musical, but um, I think we're uh, better off with 
the beginning of this interview. Jacob, I see the screen. I'm here. You're back. Okay. We've had some interesting stuff, uh, some musical tunes playing. Oh, there you are. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just splice it all together. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so you're talking about perfection and permanence and the imagery that you, you know, you put on the walls and what permanence means for that. What uh, I think that it can thought? be, yeah, I just think that it can be, I guess the best way to speak about it is like one example would be <clears throat> a woman that, walk, that walks by and she says like, are you going to get a permit for that? And she's more worried about it getting painted over than I am. And, and I think it's just like the difference in accepting, like, you know, I've put it up, like I've done my work and contributed and like left it to kind of grow. And then, um, you know, if that's for a day, if it lasts longer, that's really cool. But uh, I don't know, it's just like the cultivation of it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Cultivation of it. Like, um, you know, you've taken a stance, you've, you've put it up and made your statement. And I really, it's just a matter of who's going to see it at that point. Hmm. If it makes an impact. Exactly. Okay, so you've already told us what uh, you've got going on for art week you've got three murals and you've provided those addresses anything four, else we got we have four of them oh you're going to be murals. doing okay so there's yeah. a fourth mural which we've talked about before but, uh, <laughs> tell me about there's that just, uh there's just two of them at um near the roosevelt shopping center it, it's kind of neat it'll be on both sides of ah. uh so that it'll be on the north side and the south side of the building so it'll be pretty neat just overnight, we'll have artwork on two opposite sides of the street. So I'm excited for that. Good. And future projects, anything in mind? Oh, uh, just cover every blank wall that we can put some paint on. So uh, yeah, I think I think it'll just kind of keep leading to other projects. So great. Keep the energy going. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, well, th thank you. You know, we, today we've had on the show, we've had Jacob Cooperman. Jacob, thanks a lot. I really appreciate you sharing your time and thoughts about yourself and your art. No, it was my pleasure. Thanks for taking the time to talk to, art, uh, talk to me about some art. I appreciate it. Great, thanks. Art Week is June 19th through June 26th. Check out artweek.com to see virtual and online events and use the tip jar if you see art that you like and you want to support the artist or even buy their work if that's something that, that strikes you. This is Dan Troxel signing off. See ya.